Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the FIDE Candidates 2022. Eight players, 14 rounds to determine who will play Magnus Carlsen in the next World Championship match, or which two people will play a match against each other because Magnus walks away from the World Championship crown, which is something that he said that he may do. All right. After five rounds of action, Jan Nepomniši leads with three and a half out of five, followed by Fabiano Caruana with three out of five, a group of guys with two and a half, and a group of guys with two. Today's recap can only be described with one word, and that word is horrible. The recap itself will not be horrible, but so many horrible things happen in today's round, or great things, depending on who you support. Let's jump right into them, okay? A shocking day of games at the Candidates. We begin with the game between Hikaru Nakamura and Ding Li Ren. A very curious game. You know, Hikaru has had a very good event thus far. Obviously lost his first round, but bounced back with a win over Rajabov. Ding still trying to get hot. And what will Hikaru do in terms of the repertoire choice? He goes for the Italian. And what's funny is that uh, Ding plays uh, into the same exact system that he played against Duda. Now, you don't have to remember that. But I'm telling it to you now. So this line where black very early plays the move a5, preventing white from expanding with b4, grants white the access to this square, which is exactly what white does. And this is what Duda played against Ding. Ding played this obscure move queen to b8, anticipating the opening of this side of the board, with queen going to a7, right? And then all of this over here. And in that game, Duda did not take on c6, but rather played knight f1, and then chess got played. So Hikaru could have reasonably expected these 10 moves. So he prepared them, and he took on c6, which is the second most common move, and immediately went for d4. So then he obviously anticipated pawn takes, pawn takes, and in this position, the bishop can go here, but it can also play a little bit more aggressively with the move bishop to b4, which I'm sure he had prepared, but Ding goes back to b6. So Hikaru rattles off yet another move. Ding thinks a little bit and plays the move rook to e8. Hikaru rattles off his next move. So Hikaru hasn't even thought for a second. 15 moves, blitzed out, anticipating everything that Ding is gonna do. At this point, there is one game in the database that's important, and that's the game Anish Giri versus David Anton Giharo. European Team Championship 2019 or 17, where David Anton played the move queen to b7 and went on to lose the game. Not because he played the move queen to b7, but that's what he played in the game. In this game, Ding, after some thought, plays queen to a7, which is obviously the idea, really. It seems like behind this move, right? And Hikaru blitzes out the move knight to f1. Doesn't even think. Ding thinks for a while and plays the move d5, trying to make something happen in the center of the board. Hikaru blitzes out the move e5, still not thinking. Knight comes into e4 and Hikaru opts to remove this active knight. Now, just so you understand, black is on the verge of being completely lost. I just want you to understand, like this position, or let's just say white takes with the queen, just so you understand like what we're up against. Black, their entire position hinges on one move, whether or not black can play c5. If black can reactivate this dead bishop, black is okay, and that's the entire purpose. But if you give black a couple of moves and black does not play c5, black is dead lost, like plus five. I mean, you let Stockfish think, I mean, it's not plus four, maybe plus three, but it's over. So that's the entire game plan of Ding Li Ren. At some point, he will play the move c5. Hikaru blitzes out another move. Hikaru blitzes out another move. Hikaru blitzes out all of these moves. 23 moves he hasn't thought for a second. Maybe he went to p. Bishop back to d7. The idea here was that if the bishop went this way, rook c2 was very powerful, and if queen before, there's a fork. So Ding, finding all the best moves. Let me turn off my air conditioner. It was on energy saver mode, so it snuck up on me. So bishop goes back to d7, covering knight c6, and bishop f4, queen e7, Hikaru's still blitzing every move. He has not fought for 25 moves, his prep. He is up 70 minutes on the clock. One hour and 10 minutes for the numerically, uh, you know, struggling folks. And in this position, there is an absurd computer line where if black plays c6, white sacks the rook, and puts the knight here. And I would, I would bet Hikaru was begging in his brain for this to happen. Because if you know all the moves in the position, and you know you can sack a rook for a knight, you're like, oh, I'm gonna get him, I'm gonna get him. But Ding, cold-blooded, is like, nope. Let's trade, 
And finally, Hikaru started thinking. It took 27 moves for Hikaru to be out of his preparation. In this position, there is an idea to rotate the rook over here and just abandon taking this pawn. Black has a pass pawn in all of the complications. That is Black's greatest asset. The, the, the more that pawn goes up the board, the bigger of a problem it becomes for White. And there's a lot of complicated lines. White can also actually take the knight and enter a heavy piece endgame, right? Queen takes on g3, queen d4, there's a check, but the king goes to safety. Very complicated heavy piece endgame, right? Just a, a lot of imbalances. You know, black tries to trade queens, maybe. Um, but we have rook takes a5, the knight kicks out the bishop, and the pawn just starts walking. Hikaru here, in the next two moves that he played, spent all his time. Okay? Literally all of it. This move, retreating back to a3, he spent maybe 15 minutes, I don't exactly recall. On the next move, Hikaru spent 51 minutes. And that is because even though all of your preparation up to a certain point could be good, it doesn't mean you have an advantage. It was never better for white. The Spanish is not an opening where you just get a plus 5 advantage and crush somebody. So maybe here, bishop takes g5 was necessary. Maybe that he had to go for this endgame. He didn't, you know, he didn't remember that, and he decided to go for this, but look at Ding's pawn. And now his queen gets active. And suddenly, Ding's position is beautiful. He is going to win back the pawns that he gave away. This pawn is a b... Is a, it's two pawns, it's two squares away from becoming a queen. The only way for white to potentially cause problems for black here is what Hikaru does, which is fly out to h5. He has to immediately create counterplay. Because if he doesn't, it might be all over. The computer here recommends that Ding plays king f8, potentially, to try to avoid this incoming attack. Ding doesn't do that. He takes the pawn and allows this, pushes the d-pawn, but Hikaru blockades it in time, and now the attack is knocking on the door. Ding invites Hikaru in for t, and the players repeat moves. So... The summary of this game is unbelievable preparation by Hikaru, unbelievable defense by Ding, and maybe if Hikaru remembered the move, like maybe if he had to like, maybe this was the notes in his, I don't know. He could have posed a few more problems, but a fantastic display of preparation by White, a fantastic display of tenacity by Black, and uh, yeah, I mean, when it got hot, make the draw, you know, bail out, make the draw. Um... The next game that I have for you is, uh, this is where really the horrible stuff begins. So, first we have Report repeating a Taimanov. So he played this three times now. Duda played bishop f4, uh, and Fabiano in this position played g4. Rajabov does not play into a main line and goes for a sideline of queen d3, queen rotating to g3. This is some absurd variation. But basically, white is like, I'm not going to touch these pawns. Your pawns are stupid. You cannot develop your bishop. I will take on g7. What are you going to do? And, uh, well, I'm going to move a flank pawn and attack your queen. And he's like, nope, no, you're not going to do that. Now what are you going to do? Okay, I'm going to push this pawn, and now your knight has to undevelop. And now I'm going to attack your pawn in the center. Well, I'm going to push the pawn and attack the knight. Well, I'm going to move the knight and attack the queen. Well, I'm going to move the queen and attack the knight. Well, I'm going to defend my knight. Believe it or not, this completely absurd position has occurred in like seven or eight games. And believe it or not, white allows a check and just moves the king. This has happened before. In a game between Maxim Vashelagrav and Yan Nipomnishi 2021 Zagreb rapid game. In that game, f5 was played, en passant was played, knight takes back on f6 was played. And in that game, white, I think, played c3, if I'm not mistaken. And try to get a little bit of development here. Like, you can take, I can take, you can take. But white gets a, you know, a dynamic piece of play here with the bishops, the open files. Rajambov did not remember that and instead gave a check. And Report moved his king to d7. Now, if you were to show me this position just like this, I would say two 400s played it. I mean, obviously, this is not, this is not a candidate's game. It's two 400s. Both, got, both moved their king, they don't know how to castle, they forgot how to castle. Queens are staring at each other, probably have been staring at each other for like 10 minutes. I mean, this is just not a game at the candidate's level. No, it is. And the craziest thing is, this is like cutting-edge theory. Like, according to the machine, this is the best way to play. Rajabov develops his bishop, 
Rook goes to f8, and now we see why it was kind of important to create fast counterplay, because now by the time you do it, black is very stable. The king is actually safe. The bishop is going to b7. That is why the king is safe on the d7 square. And black is going to create an avalanche of counterplay on the b-file and the f-file. Rook is going to go down this way. But imagine for a second there's no pieces on the board except pawns. In all endgames, black is lost, okay? Black is lost because black has three pawn islands and a Swiss cheese of a position. White has 3-3. Three, three. So in all endgames, white has a really good structure, okay? In all endgames, black is losing. So we have a queen trade and rook b8, right? That's what I said. Rook b8, you cannot guard this pawn because you save the pawn but lose a rook, which is not a good trade. So we have knight d2, rook b2, and now a fork. Okay, we have a little bit of a, not quite a fork, that's a fair trade. Report can move his rook back, but instead gives a check and completely sacrifices the rook. I mean, you gotta love this man. This man is absolutely brilliant. The whole game I thought Report was playing for a win. Knight g4 is a brilliant move. Uh, the idea of knight g4 being if this, then rook f2, and this, and black is not even down material. White's rooks are on their home squares. The bishops are hanging out on, you know, on the treetop somewhere looking around. And, and, but but report here began uh, sorry Rajabov here began playing super resourcefully, um, and he played f3, baited in the rook, and now the bishop has to go back right to guard the rook. I grab a knight, you check me. I safeguard my king with a sacrifice of my piece. You were going to take me, right? You were going to take me. I walk you into a pin. Very nice defensive idea. Then I take, and now we have a position of opposite colored bishops, and white is down two pawns. But I told you a while ago, this endgame is garbage for black. It is, even up two pawns, the position is equal. And only one player is playing for a win, and it's the guy with white. Check, king goes to c7, and look at the king. The king has no legal moves. I mean, literally, like, if white bishop is here, it's mate. I mean, it, does, it can't move like that, but bishop e5 is mate. The king is just mated, because black's structure is so bad. So, report plays, bishop b7, we have this move, we have rook e8, check, king c8. Okay, but at least report is safe. The only way that Rajabov can win this game is by moving his bishop back on this diagonal and infiltrating with his rook. If white's rook successfully gets to f7, white wins. If you play rook f1 right now, what does black play to stop rook f7? Rook f6, right? So that's the game plan, bishop e5. Okay, now there's no rook f6. So what does black have to do here? This is a good move because you can get rook e4 to kick out the bishop, right? So rook f1. Here comes the game plan of rook f7, right? Black here has one move and one move only, and that move is c5, liberating the bishop at long last. <gasps> Breathing a gas, uh, inhaling some air because after rook f7, rook g2 check. King h3, you survive by attacking the bishop. That is the only way you survive. The bishop can hang around, you attack it again. The bishop can hang around, you attack it again. You just harass the bishop. By the time I get down here, just in time, you save yourself and it's a draw. The king has just enough room. Report blunders. He gives the game away. What did he do? He gave Rajabov the bishop retreating square. He gave him bishop h2. He checked Rajabov. And now Rajabov wins the game, bishop h2, and the game is over. It's not, it's not resignation on the spot. But rook f7 is coming, that's it. The bishop has protection, it's over. Rook f, that's it. It's game over. Bishop back to h2, if you play e5, rook f7, you cannot protect the bishop. Bishop a8, rook a7. You cannot, folks, uh, when I say the game is over, it's over. The best that black can do is this. Rajabov has to play. Bishop back to h2. He doesn't. He makes a draw. He forces a draw. It's just repetition. Rook c7, that's it. It's just a draw. He had four minutes on the clock to find the move. Bishop to h2. He didn't play it. I... I, w I, I mean, when I saw this live, I was like legitimately just completely flo- I mean, I just- I don't know what he missed. I don't know what he missed. I have no clue what he missed. Nobody knows what he missed! None of the commentators knew what he missed! And before you get all, you wouldn't have found that move? No! Because I wouldn't have played at the tournament! Stop all this nonsense that you can't criticize a player- Why didn't he see Bishop H2? What could he have possibly missed? I don't know! 
I don't know. It's not like he had four seconds. He had four minutes and 37 seconds right now. And he played the move Rook F7. And maybe he just didn't expect to get a winning chance. I don't know. But this was just step one of horrible things that happened during this round. The next game that I have for you is the game between Jan Nepomniši and Jan Krzysztof Duda. Knight F3. D5. G3. Already. Wow. So Jan doesn't play E4, D4. He decides to throw already at Duda, anticipating that Duda's confrontational playing style is going to lead to a dynamic position that Jan could try to play for a win. And that's exactly what Duda did. Duda played one of the most imbalanced systems where uh, Jan is able to immediately ask questions with the move knight to E5. Jan completely does not develop his queen side and instead plays knight e5. And the idea of knight e5 in and of itself isn't uh, advantageous for white, but it asks a lot of questions of the black position. There is another way that black can handle this bishop g4 approach. And it's one where um, you can take on f3 and basically just like get this position. Just play rock solid. Trade the light squared bishop and just play rock solid. You are slightly worse because white has the bishop pair and it's obviously very pleasant for white, but that's another one of the approaches. And there's a, especially it's one of the approaches when uh, c4 and uh, like in a position like, uh, like this, for example, you can do something like this, creating total symmetry. Okay, that's a really nice structure. Knight c6, knight f6. Um, but in this game, that doesn't happen, and we have knight e5, and things get weird so fast because the knights fall off the board, and this pawn is untouchable. You can attack it, but white's structure is going to expand like this. And basically, the game plan here is going to be as follows. White is going to try to use the bishop as a target of attack as you expand forward. This is kind of like when a pawn is pushed where a king is castled, that's called a hook because you can target the pawn to try to open the position. This bishop is the hook of this position. White will try to play f4, king h2, g4, f5, etc, etc. And that is exactly what Jan does. He plays a couple of moves like rook c1, you know, improving his position, queen e7. But now the king steps out of this diagonal and here come the pawns, g4 and f4. And to be honest, this looks horrible for black. White cannot quite play f5, but to be honest with you, no, I can, because even though this is check, I'm winning the bishop. So Duda needs to play this and get away with the bishop. What does Jan do? He doesn't rush. He rotates the queen to g3. Just improving his position. At this point, Stockfish is claiming that black can go bishop h7 and be like, what are you doing? Like, what are you going to do? Or bishop d4. I want your pawn. But other than that, black just sits and waits. Like, black just sits there and waits until white attacks. And that is exactly what Jan is going to do. He's going to play h4. Stockfish still continues to claim that bishop d4 is possible. Just take the pawn. There's no attack. One thing engines are really bad at is evaluating attacks from a distance. Like, when they see the attack up close, they're like, oh, ho, 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 that's really serious. So they don't evaluate attacks so well. So what does Jan do after rook d8? Well, what has Jan done for the last five moves? Queen e1, queen g3, h4. What's going to be his next move? g5, of course. And apparently now was Duda's last chance to not get completely trampled. He had to play king to h8. You want me to explain this move? I can't. I mean, obviously, if there's this, you kind of get it, right? Uno reverse. But Jan can just improve his position. I mean, he doesn't... He doesn't have to rush. He doesn't have to play h5 right away. He could. He could play maybe bishop c3. But then, of course, bishop c3, there's d4. You have to be careful. But then maybe there's bishop a5 hitting the rook, and the pawn's a bit weak, and the position opens up. But Duda decides to take and then go here offering a trade of bishops. But what happens after I take and just keep attacking, right? I mean... You've now moved your queen off of the line of sight. So now the bishop is on the verge of getting completely entombed, right? Like g6 just wins a bishop. There is also e6 clearing the path for my f-pawn to triumphantly march forward, okay? There is also just f6 on its own, and you have to entomb your own bishop, which is horrible. 
So this is, which makes bishop b4 a really difficult move. Now here, Stockfish gave a move after queen b2, which was the most absurd line I had ever seen in my life. Um, you first block the attack with rook c3, and when black attacks the rook, you play e6. You sacrifice the rook entirely. If black takes the pawn, you play f6. If black takes the rook, you play queen to c7. And mate is... Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You take first, forcing the king out. Then you play queen c7. And checkmate is unavoidable. Queen, two rooks, bishop. Nobody can stop mate. Nobody can stop mate. Jan had to play rook c3 and then e6, cutting off the queen's line of sight all the way back. This was one of the most absurd engine lines I've ever seen, truly. Um, and uh, I actually predicted during the live broadcast that it would not happen. I did a little bit of commentary on my own stream today. I just predicted this wouldn't happen because this is kind of insane. Instead of that, Jan plays e6 straight away and then traps the bishop with g6. We knew this was going to happen. He plays rook to b1, the bishop has fallen, b7 will now fall as well, and unfortunately here, white has a bishop and black doesn't. And Stockfish in, in some ways tries to downplay the significance of the bishop, basically saying black can stabilize, the bishop is not in the game, white only has two pawns, black has five, actually white has three, but this pawn will fall. Yeah, dude is not Stockfish. Okay, he tries to play aggressively and solve his problems by grabbing every pawn that he that 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 Nepo has. But Jan just coordinates his pieces and rook f8 is coming, rook g5, rook g7 is coming, and he just cleans up. He guards his king, rook g5, queen back to f2, rook f8, rook g7, and in this position, Duda resigns because uh, he cannot stop anything. Anything from happening, like if he plays d3, for example, um, rook f takes g7, and the game is simply over. Uh, so, rook g3, and uh, Jan has won a third game. Jan has four and a half points out of six. That is incredible. That, I mean, he is making it look easy. And you know why else this is horrible in some ways? Because... Would Magnus be interested in defending his title against Jan? <laughs> I mean, seriously, right? Anish Giri has been joking on Twitter. He's like, all right, well, now it's Jan versus who's ever in second place in this tournament. So, I mean, Jan is just, I mean, he's a savage. He's up 15 points, 2781 live. And that brings me to my final game of the day. Ali Reza Firuja versus Caruana. All eyes on this game. Will Firuja make a splash and a statement and catch up? He plays a Catalan? A Catalan. He doesn't play d4 much at all, but he, he also doesn't play the Catalan. According to the database, he has one game ever in the Catalan against Richie Report in like 2016 or something. And then he doesn't play a main line. He plays a sideline. He doesn't play castles inviting dc, queen c2, a6, a4... Bishop d7, none of these lines, but queen d3 immediately defending the c4 pawn. Super sideline. Okay, so Fabi plays principled. He attacks the center with another pawn, right? In the, queen in the queen's pawn structures, they're like best friends, right? D and c pawns. Uh, now one of them falls, and a couple of moves later, another one of them falls, and we have the following position from the opening. Ten moves each. White is ever so slightly better, potentially with moves like knight c3, trying to get this pressure. This is a really pleasant situation for white, where this bishop restricts this one. Fabiano's not a bozo. He would not do that. He would probably play bishop f6. Why is my nose so itchy? Normally, it's like, my allergies, it's like, I require one nose touch. And I know sometimes when I do three or four, people in the comments are like, don't touch your nose ever, or any part of yourself or, or, or anything in your house. Just don't touch anything. And I'm sorry, I know it's distracting. My nose is just itchy. It's got, got allergies. What can I say? So knight c3 is one of the options. Rook d1 is another option. e4 is another option. And here, Firuja begins thinking. And normally that's a good sign because Firuja is a really good player. But Firuja has been doing too much of that in this tournament. He is frequently down 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes in a game. 
when the opening stage is over. So he plays rook d1, bishop f6, queen g4, and by this point in the game, I think on this move, Firuja spent 30 minutes on this move right now, move 13. You know, he can play e4, he can play knight d2 to try to go there, he can play knight a3 to try to go to c4. Those seem to be the three moves, right? He spends a long time and goes knight d2 with the idea to maybe go here or here. Uh, I think Fabi blitzed out queen e7. He didn't even think. You know why? Because he probably anticipated knight d2. Now, if you play knight e4 trying to get the bishop, then this happens. And then f5 is coming, so you gotta anticipate that, right? So... He thinks for a while and brings the knight to f3. Fabi blitzes out developing his rook. I mean, he's just developing pieces. He's not, right? And actually, you know how in the Catalan, the bishop is supposed to restrict the enemy bishop? I just showed you that line, right? Like this position. But look at Fabi's bishop. Fabi's bishop is the one restricting Ali Reza's bishop. This bishop is restricting this one. So you might have to go here and try to trade it off. Ali Reza thinks for a while again and plays e4, but suddenly, kabam! His queen is as being asked questions. It has to dance out to h5. Now the knight goes to b4 with ideas of knight c2, potentially. Okay. Now Ali Reza offers a bishop trade. We have takes, takes, and here in truly astounding fashion, Fabiano Caruana does not blunder checkmate in one and kicks the knight out and brings his own knight back. This is the 20th move of the game. They have played 19 moves. Ali Reza here, for 21 more moves, has about 15 minutes. He has spent 100 minutes on about 19 moves. What can white do here? Maybe a3, rook c1. I mean, the queen is sort of offside. And the thing is, if you rush to trade it off, black immediately jumps to the middle, freeing that up, right? But then knight f5, and maybe you trade the pieces off. What does Ali Reza do? He sacks the rook. Oh my. Ali Reza is sacrificing the rook for the bishop in order to get it back. He wants to do this. And he blunders. He didn't blunder f5. He saw f5. He blundered that the queen and the queen can now see each other. That's not the right arrow. They can see each other. And after bishop f, oh my gosh. The rook cannot be taken. The rook has to guard the queen, which hits this queen. Ali Reza spent 100 minutes on 19 moves and then proceeded to blunder an exchange. I mean, he sacked it to win it back and he just blundered at 5. He blundered at 5, queen e8. And now he is desperately trying to create an attack while being down 40 minutes, 50 minutes. And he does his best. But here comes Fabi offering a queen trade flying in to take the pawn because it's denied, solidifying his king and also getting his rook out of danger, harassing the white pieces with the active queen and using the pawn, breaking apart the white position with the e-pawn. Ali Reza goes here. The rook offers itself for a trade. And now Ali Reza has no more rooks, takes, and look at this beautiful maneuver by Fabi, the only move to keep advantage. The queen needs help. And there's no way to stop rook coming down. And once the queen and the rook link up, it's game over. The king tries to run out. Knight f7 is going to meet the king right there. Here comes rook c2. Queen down. Check. Forcing the king out. And Fabi's king is a little weak. But not as weak as the white one. By the time that the knight arrives on e6, mate will be very swiftly delivered to this king. Or the simple loss of the queen. And so Ali Reza makes a couple more moves to make it to move 40 to get his extra time. But before Fabiano even has a chance to return to the board, after playing his move queen a4, Virujo resigns the game as he sees Fabiano approaching because he knows that after h5, and uh, not queen d1 actually, I was going to make a joke. Queen d1 is what Danny Wrench blundered in the recap. Uh, not the recap, the live broadcast. It was very funny. But queen e2 once the knight moves. Don't hang your queen, folks. Um, shocking. Just absolutely shocking. Ali Reza just lost again. Jan Yipomnishi is in first place with four and a half. Then it's Fabi with four. And then it's three people with three. Ali Reza's in last place completely by himself with two points out of six. What just happened? This is officially a two-horse race I am absolutely shocked with what has gone down in round six of the candidates.
I will see you all in two days because we have a res day tomorrow. This is unreal. And I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I'll see you all for round number seven. Get out of here.